Well, hello, it's Bruce Williams again, and today I want to present the 10th and next to last lecture in my series on the selected gross pathology of the skin. We're going to talk about all of the miscellaneous diseases that I wasn't bright enough to put in any particular category. I'm sure we'll come across them and say, well, why didn't he put that in the immune mediator? Why didn't he put that in viral? So this is the grab bag. There's just a lot of fun diseases that don't fit very nicely into any particular category. Before I do that, I want to thank my friends and colleagues who provided me these great images over the years, which allowed me to put these lectures together. Well, let's start with a small pup. This is a disease that you might see in practice. We used to call it puppy strangles. That was a terrible name for this disease. But back then, we thought that it was a deep bacterial pyoderma. Turns out that this has a much better name now, juvenile sterile granulomatous dermatitis. It is a sterile disease. It's better treated with steroids than it is with antibiotics. It's a pustular and nodular dermatitis with edema that primarily affects the face. You can see the lymph nodes blow up as well. Older dogs have a similar condition, which is known as sterile pyogranuloma syndrome. All the bacterial infections that we thought were causing this disease turned out to be secondary. These animals rarely can go septic and may have joint pain and shifting lame, lame lignesses, but uh, it is not a bacterial, certainly has nothing to do with strangles. Well, here's a disease that is primarily seen in dachshunds. You have these large plaques of uh, uh, seborrheic, greasy uh, cutaneous proliferation with hyperpigmentation, usually starts around the uh, the axilla and inguinal regions can spread over the abdomen, and the condition is known as acanthosis nigricans. There's no predisposed cause, and it usually starts with this axillary hyperpigmentation and then uh, progresses to alopecia with lichenification. Um, affected animals are usually develop this in less than two years of age. It bears no resemblance to acanthosis nigricans in humans. Here's a great picture by Dr. Fabrizio Grandi. And if you look very closely, you'll see that the philtrum of the nose is sort of going away. You have this hemorrhage here, and it's not a good strong philtrum. There's a little bit of hyperkeratosis over the top. And this is a condition that is known as proliferative arteritis of the nasal philtrum. It has an unknown etiology, as do most of the diseases in this particular lecture. And it is associated with an inflammatory process against the uh, small and medium-sized arterioles of the nasal filtrum. Does have a bit of a breed predilection with St. Bernard's, Basset Hounds, and Samoyeds being uh, affected. It's something that you probably will need a biopsy to do. There's usually a big crusted ulcer on the nasal filter. You want to think about your immune-mediated disease as well, especially Pemphigus fulgaris, the ones that attack the uh, uh, the mucosa, maybe even uh, uveo dermatologic syndrome in these animals. But a biopsy will show definite immune-mediated disease directed against arteriolar walls. Here's a classic disease of young dogs, especially large breeds like Great Danes and German Shepherds. We talked about calcinosis cutis, a form of dystrophic mineralization uh, in the last lecture, which is attributed to high levels of circulating corticosteroids. Well, this is another form of dystrophic mineralization, or mineralization of devitalized tissue. It looks very different. Usually these are focal areas which are seen uh, on the uh, bony promises, may be seen in the tongue, areas of repetitive trauma or areas where somebody has buried a suture. What we're looking at here is large lakes of mineral which are surrounded by granulomatous inflammation. Usually we see these in young dogs and they grow and they stop when the physes close as well. It's a great biopsy specimen. You can even diagnose it on cytologies. 
This is calcinosis circumscripta. Well, here's sort of a ooey gooey uh, bit of skin from a Sharpe, a great picture from Dr. Paolo Roccabianca. And you can see these sort of bulgy areas, which are somewhat amphiphilic or silvery in color. And this can be a normal finding in certain breeds of dogs, like Sharpe's and, and Cocker Spaniels. Or, as we previously mentioned, this can be uh, increased in animals with hypothyroidism. It's the normal you know, glycosaminic glycans, hyaluron sulfate, um, which is in the uh, skin, but there's just too much of it. I love this picture, another great picture by Fabrizio Grandi down at Sa Sao Paulo Vet School. And I didn't even know about this one when he posted it on our Facebook page uh, a couple of months ago. And notice how the hair is turning gold on the leg of this three-month-old miniature schnauzer. The name of this disease is acquired aurotrichia of miniature schnauzers. Um, but I like the other name. This is gilding syndrome, where the hair turns gold. Um, the age of onset appears to be variable from very young to middle-aged. And this coat change is not really associated with other clinical signs, although the dogs may present um, with a number of other cutaneous diseases, probably has nothing to do with them. And the, uh, the hair tends to turn gold in the periocular areas, the ears, and on the dorsal thorax and abdomen. This is gilding syndrome in miniature schnauzers. Well, this isn't my dog, but I certainly had one like this. This is a Doberman pincher, and you can see a focal area on the carpus where the dog has licked and licked and licked. There's a classic lick granuloma. We see this in dogs with a nervous predisposition. Dogs are left by their loan and they get these started and they just continue to lick. Uh, histologically, the classic lesion is ulceration with blood vessels and fibroblasts oriented perpendicularly to the lesion. I don't know how that particularly works, but I've seen it enough to know. But usually when you see something, on the uh, on the carpus of a dog, although you can have it anywhere else on the dog, which is ulcerated with a lot of granulation tissue and fibrosis, even if the classic histologic picture isn't there. Lick granulomas or acral lick granulomas have to be in your morpho your uh, differential diagnosis somewhere. They are the devil because it's more of a behavioral problem in these dogs. And unfortunately, the dog I had um, licked and licked and licked till it got down into the joint. We had to amputate that leg. Then he started on the other leg and finally we just had to put him down. Moving on to cats. Um, we mentioned this one before, feline ulcerative dermatitis syndrome. I put it in there so I don't forget about psychogenic alopecia. Generally, it's that's a bilateral thing. Um, these animals may have hypersensitivity as well. Look for EOs or mast cells on a biopsy. And I think that I would probably put this into the ulcerative dermatitis syndrome because this is a fat cat and it, I would be very surprised if it could get to that spot. But just want to just, and psychogenic alopecia doesn't really have a huge uh, uh, diagnostic uh, biopsy. Usually it's areas of ulceration with areas of linear fibrosis because these animals have been looking for a while. A lot of times you'll see nothing on a biopsy because they'll just take the hair off. But usually you're going to see some areas of self-trauma due to their rough tongues. Here's a cool lesion that is seen primarily in kittens. It's a great picture by Dr. Karen Moriello. Um, and this is proliferative and necrotizing otitis externa of kittens. I could put this, I think, in the uh, immune-mediated diseases. If a little more was known about it, it appears to be a, uh, a, the result of uh, keratin apoptosis with infiltration of CD3-positive T-cells and elevated levels of K2 
caspase 3 are present in those keratinocytes, it actually is very well treated by tacrolimus. And, and the biopsy of this is just a thick necrotic uh, layer over a pretty good uh, looking dermis in the ears. Proliferative and necrotizing otitis externa of kittens. I don't think we get as many biopsies as we usually should of this because uh, practitioners, at least dermatologists, know about it. So they tend not to biopsy it too often. They'll just treat it with tacrolimus and it'll go away. Ah, horsies. Um, this is proud flesh. Okay, I've had to deal with a number of these in my early career. It's never a lot of fun. They're almost always on the, uh, uh, on the, near the hoof of the animal, sometimes uh, on the underside, maybe near the prepuce. And what this is, is a tremendous amount of granulation tissue. There's been a previ previous trauma in this area, a cut. I had one uh, horse uh, on a naval base get involved and I'll tore up with uh, razor wire. And usually it starts out with a wound. And because of the fact that in this area of the leg, you have a combination of excessive movement, minimal soft tissue, and generally poor circulation and drainage, the granulation tissue grows a lot faster than the, uh, the horse is able to re-epithelialize the wound. And so you get this area of proud flesh. It is miserable to try and get the fix. You can't excise it because it's just going to bleed all over the place. You have to try and find a way. There's a lot of, I remember there used to be a lot of formulation that you put on proud flesh, which would try to slow down the, 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 uh, the growth of the granulation tissue. Granulex, I think, was one. Okay, a couple of other things that really don't fit into any type of lecture that I have, and I am not a lameness guy in horses, but I do want to, to show at least one a uh, decent hoof lesion. This is canker. Okay, canker is a chronic hypertrophic pododermatitis of the frog and the sole. There's a frog up here, the sole, and eventually it's going to get into the hoof wall at the white line. It's mostly common in draft breeds. They're very heavy. Sometimes they are not in, kept in the best kind of uh, uh, conditions. And like other types of foot rot, which we've mentioned earlier in some of these lectures, you're going to get a lot of different bacteria out of it. Um, Fusobacterium is always there. It's a commensal in everybody's poop. Treponema. We said treponema you would see. Um, uh, Prevotella. All of these ones that uh, you're going to, uh, that will just be present in the environment and are usually seen in chronic foot wounds, you're going to be able to culture out of this too. Rarely you might even get pa bovine papillomavirus 1 and 2 because the frogs are places where you can traumatize and start the formation of a sarcoid. Uh, yeah, usually wet environments, poor sanitation. And just another one, chronic proliferation and, and bacterial infection, usually anaerobes of the frog in this case. Usually it stinks to high heaven as well. It starts off looking sort of like uh, cauliflower, this way it's papillary projections. And it, as it gets worse, you know, it tends to get dark and hyperpigmented and, and uh, really bad looking. You gotta trim off all this, be very careful with, uh, with sanitation and wrap the animal's foot. It's just really difficult to do. Oh, I didn't have too much in cattle. This is one from Dr. Helen Acklin that I love. And we're looking at the chest of the animal around the brisket. And the fat has broken down. And the name of the condition, uh, which is usually seen in downer cows, is putty brisket. That's a great old name for a lesion. And you can imagine how animals that are down would be, you know, they're big heavy animals that are laying on the, the subcutaneous fat. And eventually you'd have ischemic change and fat necrosis. And if it's in the brisket, it's called putty brisket. Here's a condition that goes by a number of names. It's been around forever. I learned it as pityriasis rosea which is also human disease, which doesn't look at all like this. And now it is called juvenile pustular and psoriasiform dermatitis. The psoriasiform um, refers to the very erythematous elevated uh, lesions that are seen in these animals. This is a great picture of it. It's almost always seen uh, on the ventral abdomen. It, it looks like these raged serpiginous lesions 
on the abdomen. The inguinal usually starts in the inguinal areas, moves forward. Don't rarely see it on the uh, on the flanks of the animal. It's a sporadic disease. Nobody's ever been able to figure out what it is. Usually, the animals are between eight and fourteen weeks old, but occasionally you'll see it as young as two weeks, and rarely in pigs uh, approaching a year. Uh, seems to be more common in animals with very high stocking densities and you can actually this will go away if you put the animals so you segregate them and and give them some time it starts out as little red papules and then they they uh, uh, become raised and they coalesce forming these uh, transient lesions center of these lesions is usually flat uh, just like the surrounding skin yeah, you can look at a biopsy. Most of these are made, obviously, on the farm, and uh, it will spontaneously recover. It does, you know, especially in, in cases that look like this. This is all also um, juvenile pustular and psoriasiform dermatitis. I think that you have to have some good rule outs because, to me, this could very easily be pox. And uh, another condition we're going to talk about in just a minute in the next lesion is uh, dermatosis vegetans, a cutaneous and pulmonary disease of Landrace pigs. So uh, this one is pityriasis rosea. I probably would not want to put this one on an exam because there's so many rule outs. But something like this with these serpiginous lesions, um, I don't think there's anything else that looks like that in the pig. Dermatosis vegetans is a condition that uh, is a autosomal recessive disease of Landrace pigs. Um, it's usually young animals, and the lesions will be uh, uh, usually evident by about three to four weeks of age. Um, what happens is you get these sort of raised lesions, which are infiltrated by large numbers of eosinophils and macrophages. The animals will also have a concurrent giant cell pneumonia. Um, and you may see foot deformities as a result of this lesion affecting the coronary band. Um, because of the pneumonia, most of the pigs die within six weeks. So it's something that the swine raising industry has tried to address by culling all of the parents of these affected pigs in the land race. And, you know, it pops up from time to time. They say, oh, we, we've taken care of it. And uh, Dr. King used to say, how do you get rid of a disease? You, you cut the mother's throat. And once you think about it, yeah, you have to get rid of the moms that give raise to these particular animals. But uh, so what happens is you get these big raised weepy lesions and this black stuff, um, they're not characteristically black. You'll see some that look like this and, and you think, oh my gosh, that's a melanoma. Or this is actually just dirt. These are raised weepy reddish lesions that look like this, characterized by hyperkeratosis and acanthosis and infiltration by a lot of leukocytes as we previously mentioned and uh, lots of eosinophils. And eosinophils do a lot of damage more than any other type of inflammatory cells. And why pigs, especially, throw eosinophils at a variety of lesions, I have no idea. It must be some sort of death wish. But, uh, so this is what they normally do if you have a pig that's very, kept in very clean conditions. If maybe they're just kept in dirty conditions with poop around, this is what it's going to look like. But it is, uh, a disease of Landrace pigs, and there are a number of issues whenever it pops up somewhere to, you know, completely wipe out that line of pigs. Okay, cyanosis. Cyanosis is seen in the ears, you'll see it on the nose, you'll see it on the tips of the ears, the tail, uh, the extremities, and you see it with a wide variety of diseases, primarily gram-negative sepsis. Some of the, uh, one of the things that I would look at would be, um, let's see, in this particular case, this is a case of Salmonella cholera suis. It's a host-adapted cholera suis. Pigs get two different types. They get Salmonella cholera suis, which is host-adapted and gives us a septicemia rather than a, uh, a necrotizing uh, tiflocolitis. Salmonella typhimurium is more the necrotizing tiflocolitis with rectal strictures. But uh, anything that, that gives you a systemic endotoxemia, 
um, any really hot gram negative in pigs may end up with this severe cyanosis, thrombosis, and necrosis of the tips of the ears and other parts of the body. Probably also think about actinobacillus pleuronemoniae and actinobacillus suis. Maybe uh, another great one would be erysipelothrix rhusiopathy. That is one that definitely likes to cause uh, systemic thrombosis. So those are a couple good ones, salmonella, actinobacillus, and erysipelothrix when you are looking at uh, uh, ear tip necrosis and cyanosis in pigs. Um, this is one from Dr. Dramatic Pupil that actually was a case of frostbite. But how you would tell that from other uh, causes would be very difficult. And I think that there are m more causes, especially in uh, confined swine pro producing operations of uh, uh, septicemia than you would see true frostbite. But I guess you gotta think about that. There's that frostbite you can see. Very well demarcated area of necrosis. On some of these other animals that had the, uh, uh, the systemic thrombosis, and I don't want to forget um, porcine pestivirus or classical swine fever, African swine fever, because those also cause thrombosis too due to the virus's effect on endothelial cells. But uh, with, with cases of uh, either viral or bacterial cause, as opposed to frostbite. I think you're going to see a lot more hemorrhage throughout. When you open up the animal, you're going to see hemorrhage. Frostbite, yeah, it's gonna cause these extremities, but you're not gonna see anything on the inside of the animal. It's a lot warmer in there. Ah, oh, pigs and vices and trauma and chewing, tail biting and ear biting and flank biting and tail sucking. And um, they, uh, young pigs just like to chew on each other. And we go back to this uh, frostbite. So we probably thought that looked pretty tasty. So they will do it. And it's a, it is a well-known vice. And uh, you have to watch them real carefully and you have to take out, to start with, take out the more aggressive animals. And then, then you have to look at the entire operation, see if you can figure out are there any predisposing causes that put some of these pigs at risk. But it happens quite a bit. And trauma is not simply associated with uh, pigs. Here we're looking at uh, a sheep. And this is a victim of uh, dog attacks. Uh, chasing by dogs can do really serious damage to sheep, even if the dogs don't catch them. Um, the animals can get stressed out, pregnant ewes may miscarry. Um, and they may often be seriously injured by their panicked attempts to escape. So uh, this is why in some countries where there is intensive sheep production, if a dog gets loose and starts um, bothering someone's sheep, it is still legal to shoot a dog that is worrying sheep. Um, when this animal heals, then you may have other problems pop up, such as uh, uh, fly strike. Here's a great old picture, 1963, by Dr. David Dodd. Um, and these are wool cysts. We're looking at the underside of the wool. These are just big cysts. I think you could have a wool cyst like you could have uh, any type of follicular cyst in a dog. They just tend to be uh, much larger. Wool cysts. Poor sanitation. In, in horses, we saw the canker. Um, guinea pigs or one that uh, this is a, just a bad case of urine scald. And uh, you know, guinea pigs, if you're gonna have a guinea pig, you need to realize that they're gonna make a mess of their cage on a daily basis. And cages for guinea pigs usually have to be cleaned out a minimum of one for a large cage and sometimes multiple times a day. They are indiscriminate peers and poopers. They're happy to poop in their food bowl. Um, but you've got to clean it out. A lot of people get these and they don't know the amount of care that they require. And so it's really sad when you see these cases of, of uh, you know, benign neglect. Uh, we looked at uh, Bigfoot or Staphylococcus associated pododermatitis. Um, that's also a cause of not cleaning the cages out. So you just have to be real careful with pet rodents and lagomorphs. And, and you're gonna wanna be able to 
or have the time to be able to clean them out. Guinea pigs are fantastic pets, but they do make a mess. Uh, here is one, um, and we might have put it in the first lecture um, on a developmental defects, but this is a classic condition which is known in mice, and it's called ringtail. And for many years, this was thought to be a combination of low environmental humidity and low environmental temperature. Um, and possibly genetics, because certain strains of mice were well known to get this. But there has been uh, a number of papers in the last couple of years suggesting that these might be very regional cornification defects. And because the skin is not shed evenly and persists in these sort of bands, um, it, this skin never comes off. And so it basically causes an infarction. I think that you need to also consider very briefly stuff that might be in the bedding, if there are threads or it's sort of a, you know, something that can get wrapped around the tail. But in the cases like this, it's a classic case of ringtail. Probably also has something to do with hydration status, and nutritional state. It's a multifactorial condition. And don't forget the recent publications on uh, cornification defects in ringtail animals. Oh, this is a little. Uh, a uh, white mouse, Dr. Lauren Ritchie, uh, had this picture. And these are known as this, this loss of hair um, is known as a clown mouse. And usually it's the runt of the litter. Uh, it's associated with various uh, alopecia and hyperkeratosis. Hair cycles extend from the head to the tail. So these animals will lose all their hair, they'll become crusty, and then they'll start growing it back from the head to the tail. Um, causes, it could simply be like we've seen in uh, guinea pigs, it could simply be that the animal has some sort of concurrent disease and uh, they have better things to do than spend a lot of energy um, on growing hair. So it could be a severe case of telogen effluvium um, and eventually if the animal comes back um, it can grow back in. These are cl clown mice. Oh, here's uh, some fun, and I've seen this in a number of species. This one just happened to be a mouse, and the reason it looks so puffed up is because it has a widespread subcutaneous emphysema. Um, this is a cat with subcutaneous emphysema, and when you peel back the skin, because of all the air under it, it's like little Rice Krispies. And when you touch the animal, it's like that uh, bubble wrap because you get lost. And usually it has to do with some sort of puncture of the, uh, uh, of the major airways and leakage of air back underneath the skin. Um, I've seen them in people who would, or veterinarians who would, uh, when they were intubating cats, put a coat hanger down in there to help it get in there, but they punctured the airway of several cats and, and caused them to blow up. So subcutaneous emphysema, look for a bubble wrap uh, feel to the skin of these animals. They'll be sort of big and blown up like a balloon. Other forms of trauma, uh, we're looking at a dolphin and it's not uncommon to see in wild dolphin these rake marks. Um, they may be from sharks, but they're probably from other dolphins. They may serve as a portal of entry for bacterial, fungal, or uh, pox viral infections, but not uncommon in wild animals. Uh, very tragic uh, is any interaction between manatees and, uh, and boats. And this one uh, is one that probably left to its own might be able to heal. This one obviously is not going to. About 40% of manatee deaths uh, in the wild are due to boats. Think about that. Oh, here's a fun thing. Um, this is called blood sweats. It's seen in tapers, uh, in Malayan tapers. And there's a couple pigments in there, uh, hipposidoric acid. And it's not really blood. It's a metabolite of some amino acids. And uh, these are pigments. So it is thought that in animals that do this, uh, they act as a sunblock. And then the, the, the red pigment appears to be a particularly good antibiotic. You can see it on other animals, including hippos, uh, rarely rhinoceroses, and uh, so they 
not only protect the animal from the sun, but they also inhibit a number of types of pathogenic uh, bacteria. Uh, we're looking at the finger of a non-human primate. I should have put this up with the other one. This is also calcinosis uh, circumscripta, a focal area of mineral with granulomatous inflammation. And usually in dogs, you see the pressure points, uh, previous areas of trauma. In, in non-human primates, they're always uh, at, at previous areas of trauma. This one probably got bit in the finger and just an area of uh, dystrophic calcification or mineralization of dead or devitalized tissue. A rabbit, um, and this is a exfoliative dermatitis um, and sebaceous adenitis. This is seen in a number of breeds of pet rabbits. This looks like a Dutch belted. And they, these are non-paritic. It is not very easily treated. And exfoliative dermatitis has also been seen in association um, with thymoma in the rabbit as well as thymoma in the cat. Staying with the bunnies. Here's more trauma. Well, we tend to think of bunny rabbits as nice animals, but uh, male bunnies, even female bunnies, will fight. Um, and these are fight wounds. Some other bunnies chewed the ears off. This is not their primary target. Actually, when you get uh, uh, bucks in a fight, they try to castrate each other. If you've seen the uh, scrotum of, of male rabbits, um, it is unhaired and a pretty easy target. So if they can get them over on the back, they'll go for the scrotum first. But if they can get a hold of the ear, that's fine. You know, we tend to think about mice and rats and rabbits as, as you know, nice little animals, but they do a lot of trauma to each other. Bite wounds are very common in uh, uh, rabbits and, and rodents that are mixed. Um, for many years, rabbits have been used to test a number of products. Um, and oftentimes, they will put a catheter into or just inject material into the external ear veins, which can be fairly prominent. But if you get it outside, if you get a caustic chemical outside, then you're going to have the animal slough their ear. More urine scald. More urine scald in rabbits is called hutch burn. And it's associated, obviously, with uh, unsanitary conditions. Sometimes people um, just have their uh, rabbit hutches designed poorly. And this is a, a bunny rabbit with uh, hair loss from its face for rubbing against cage. It may also do them from boredom too, but a lot of times they'll do it if the uh, water is put in a, a difficult place. And then finally, a great picture from Dr. Martha Delaney. Um, and this is an animal that uh, uh, I don't work with at all. This is a naked mole rat, and they also get, uh, they get a form of calcinosis cutis as they, uh, they age. Supposedly naked mole rats don't get a lot of cancer, there have been some papers recently about cancer, but these areas of whitish discoloration are areas of uh, dystrophic mineralization. It seems to be a thing in old naked mole rats. Okay, so that brings us to the end of this particular lecture. We only have one more. We're going to talk about neoplastic lesions uh, tomorrow. So I look forward to bringing you that. As always, I'm wishing you a wonderful day, fantastic health, and I'll see you another time.